all have access to this, and I think it actually, uh, <laughs> I think it actually uh, goes live uh, uh, after this, and anyone can see it. Um, as you may have noticed, I am not uh, the great Ron Purewall. Uh, my name is Tommy Wallace. I'm another instructor, actually, also uh, here in San Francisco, uh, along with Ron. Uh, he is busy today doing very important things, so I am uh, sitting in for him. Uh, it's my first time officially uh, leading a Thursdays with Ron, uh, but I, I have sat in, so I know kind of how it works. Um, just so you're all uh, aware, kind of the basic idea, um, I'm not going to be using any OG questions, and I can't reference OG questions, so be aware of that beforehand. If I ignore OG stuff, it's because it's copyrighted, so I kind of have to. Uh, so I'm going to be doing most stuff uh, kind of on the fly a little bit. Um, I didn't get your questions until this morning. Uh, and about 90 people signed up today, uh, though there's only a few of you out there. Um, so I just kind of picked some things that I think would be the most generally helpful. So I know a lot of you had specific questions, um, and uh, I think that the majority of them are a little bit too specific for something like this. But I think there are a few things that are useful to everyone. Um, probability and combinatorics came up a lot, and I think those checks are for that and not for rates. So I think I'll probably hit probability at some point. But I think the most important thing I could do um, is actually a full-on review of all three verbal types. And, and I'll tell you why I think that, and you can uh, disagree with me or, or argue with me or wh whatever you'd like to do. I think, first of all, it's um, applicable to everyone. Um, yeah, the audio is on, so hopefully you can all hear me. If you're having any trouble, type it in the chat window. I'll see what I can do. But um, you know, verbal is general enough that it's going to serve everybody to kind of review it. Uh, even if you've reviewed recently, I think it'll still be helpful. Um, and also, you know, I, I find that most students have a real obsession with quant. Um, and you know, if you really go look at your tests, I bet I could count on no hands the a number of students in this room who are regularly scoring higher on verbal than on quant. And keep in mind, I mean the raw score and not the percentile. So the percentile will almost always be higher in verbal, but that's only because so many people take this test that don't speak English, and that's why the percentiles are kind of off. Um, but verbal is actually more important. Uh, if you don't know this already, verbal affects your score more heavily than quant does. Uh, it actually has a higher effect. So the exact same breakdown will result in a different score. In other words, like um, a 30 verbal, 40 math will be around a 500, but a 40 verbal, 30 math will be around a 550. Um, I apologize if there's, if there's too much static. Um, I'm not showing myself as kind of feeding back here, uh, which is how I would know, but uh, let me just check here. I don't want people to be blown away. La, la, la. Uh, I'm not getting too much static. I apologize in advance if I'm tough to hear. I'll try to at least enunciate very well. So there's my explanation, you guys. Um, I am going to go ahead with that. So I think I'm going to start with an overview of the three sections, then hopefully we'll have time to talk a little bit of probability combinatorics, uh, general timing stuff, and, and uh, whatnot. But that all seems to have come up fairly often. So I'm going to start, um, and let me know, by the way, uh, hopefully you'll all come with me to the next slide. Are you now seeing a blank screen? There, is a, there seems to be a bit of weirdness with Illuminate, so I want to make sure it's working for everyone. OK, beautiful. So I'm going to start here with sentence correction. Sentence correction, as most of you know, uh, I don't know how many of you have taken, uh, give me, in fact, help me out, give me a smiley face if you've taken a full-on Manhattan GMAT class. Oh, people aren't seeing a black screen? Oh, okay, interesting. Um, but Rena, you are. Um, give me a second here, you guys. Yeah, something odd happened when I came into um, the room. It was like somebody had locked you out of following me. So let me see if I can figure it out. Um, hold on. Don't worry. If I can't figure it out, you guys, I'm, I'm happy to go late if this takes a little bit time to work out because um, this was not uh, my doing. <laughs> um, Yeah, what happens if you, if you actually actively go to public screen 2? Does that not work? Um, you shouldn't have to do that. You should all be coming along with me as I move. Um, what about this? Anybody coming with me now? Yeah, that seems to work. Ah, beautiful. OK, thanks, you guys. So sentence correction, here we are. So give me a smiley face if you've taken a Manhattan GMAT class. 
Okay, and you can even smile if you've taken somebody else's class. I will understand. Uh, the smiley faces are, are up here if you guys weren't aware down there uh, over on this kind of under the participant window. Okay, so it looks like a lot of people have, maybe some people haven't. So this will be news to some people. I want to start with subject verb agreement. And that's the only one that I will give away, but I just want to make sure you know. So this is the first category that we talk about. And what I'm concerned with is a couple of things. Uh, for every sentence correction category, I think that students have a real tendency to focus on how to fix the problem. And they don't really focus on how to identify the problem. And the trouble with that is that if you can't identify that you're dealing with a particular category, you're never going to know that you're supposed to fix it. You know what I mean? So let's start here with the identification method. How do we identify sentence correction? Can anybody take a stab at it? Sorry, not sentence correction, subject verb agreement. What am I looking for to tell me, aha, I am being tested on subject verb agreement today? So here's what everybody is doing, and it's, it's what I typically find with this. Everybody is telling me how to fix it. I'm going to identify the subject and verb, maybe deal with some middlemen, and you're not wrong. That's absolutely how I'm going to fix it. But how do I deal with, how do I know? Oh, so I'm going to scan the answer choices. I see us saying, or maybe that the United States is here. What am I going to look for when I'm scanning the answer choices? Okay, so, so people are starting to say stuff that's closer. I'm going to give you some examples and I want people to tell me which one of these is subject verb agreement. Give me a second. So these are kind of two different sets of answer choices I'm putting up here. So you'll have to wait until I sort of put them all up. Okay, I want you guys to help me out. Imagine that these are the answer choices, all right? This is A, B, C, and D. Imagine E went the same way. Um, I want you to tell me in the chat window, are both of these subject verb agreement one of them or none of them? Like, you know, is it sort of one, two, both, or none? Which of these is testing me on subject verb agreement, if any? Okay, I see none. I see two. I want more. I thrive on your communication. Um, number two, it's not data sufficiency, sorry. So I'm, I'm just looking for, is question number one testing me on subject verb agreement or number two? Okay, I'm seeing two, um, two, I think one and two, one and two, none, two. Okay, people seem to be agreeing around two. Why, why would it be two, people that are saying two? How do I know? Uh, so you're saying the split that you noticed, Min, or Michelle, a few other people, was this has versus have. What's the difference? Oh, Stephanie, you, you took the words right out of my mouth. The difference between has and have is singular versus plural. What is the difference between has and had over here? Ah, so if we want to be technical about it, it would actually be present perfect versus past perfect. And what that really means is it's a tense issue. The point I'm trying to make here, you guys, and, and I think that I've made it, so I feel good as an instructor, is that people are not very good at identifying subject verb agreement. If, if someone would just tell them that was the issue, well, then it would be easy to fix. But the problem is nobody's going to tell you. You have to be able to do it yourself. So here's the identification method, okay? You're looking for verbs and or nouns split singular or plural in the answer choices. I should say singular and plural. That's how you identify subject-verb agreement. So this second example is subject-verb agreement because it's split singular plural. This first one is not. This first one is actually a verb tense split. That's a different category, okay? Everybody give me a smiley face if this makes sense, if you see now what I'm getting at. That in other words, this is how you're going to identify that, that, that the GMAT is actually testing you 
on this subject because you don't want to waste your time like trying to find all the subjects and verbs, you know, when that's not actually the issue. Okay, cool. So this part you were mostly on top of, but it helped me out nonetheless. How do I fix it? So once I've noticed, aha, it's subject verb agreement. What am I going to do? I know a few people know it because I saw some people do it. So United States, as always, you are right. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, so look for subject is a little bit of a simplification, though, though you're not wrong. Basically, I'm going to write it like this. Oops. Let's see, here we go. If the verb is split, by which I mean you know singular plural, find subject. If the subject is split, find the verb. And then stuff that a lot of people said, eliminate middlemen, which are typically modifiers of some sort, you know, and match in the same clause. Now these are all little rules, and you know, I'm not going to go over all of these little rules because I want to be efficient here. But that's the basic idea. The basic idea is once you notice this happening, if the verb is split, you find the subject. If the subject is split, find the verb. Okay? Any questions about subject verb agreement, or can I move us along to the next category? What do I mean by split? I mean that within the answer choices, there's a difference. So like this would be the split, has had is the split, or in this case, has have. And I'm sorry, I'm throwing around that term because it's sort of commonly used in our literature and in, as far as I know, most, uh, most instructor literature from any company. So split just means one particular word that is kind of tangibly, visibly different in various answer choices because it allows you to know that you're being tested on that particular issue and you can make a decision. But that plays more into kind of general basic sentence correction strategy, which I, I'm not going to go into right now. So that's what I mean by split. Hopefully it's clear or will become clear as we move forward. Okay. Next category. Does anyone remember from a class what comes after subject-verb agreement? Doesn't really matter. If you've taken a class, you'll know, but I know a lot of you haven't. So, oh, Ivan and Stephanie, thank you very much. You are both correct, even if you both spelled parallelism in a very interesting way with two R's. <laughs> parallelism is what comes next. Don't listen to me. Don't listen to me. Spelling doesn't matter on this test. Nobody cares. Um, parallelism. Okay, so now everybody knows what I mean. How do we identif identify parallelism? How do we, what are we looking for? Aha, it's a parallelism question. Cool. So everyone's on top of it. I'm going to give them a new name tonight uh, if you haven't heard this before. We call them parallel markers, but it's exactly what everyone's saying, signal words, keywords. And Stephanie gave me a couple, uh, either or. What are some other ones? What's the most important parallelism word? Yeah, and they sort of from to. Um, let's not forget commas. Commas always signal either parallelism or a different category we're going to talk about between X and Y. Yeah, there's a lot of them, right? I don't want to list them all. Uh, there are plenty of lists online in our books. Um, but the point is conjunctions are powerful. That's and or. And sometimes prepositions like from and to. So those are what we're looking for. Okay, very good. How do I fix, how do I fix them? So what's my technique? You know, once I notice, aha, parallelism, what am I going to do? Yeah, so the way I like to put it um, is we isolate the individual elements and make sure they match. Uh, now, I want to be careful. Uh, Ivan, um, I hate to, to call you out, okay? But actually, they don't need to be the same tense or the same number. I can say, I like chickens. Um, I like all kinds of pies and also ice cream, right? Pies is plural. Ice cream is singular, but that's fine. I can also say, yesterday, I went to the store, and tomorrow I'll go again, right? In this case, I have the past tense here, my parallel marker and, and the future tense here, but those are both allowed, right? So I'm allowed to change tense and number. Uh, sorry to just kind of throw that in there, but I thought it might be useful. Um, but um, Sharad said something that I think is pretty important here. We isolate the individual elements, and by element I mean the things that need to be parallel. And one way to do that is whatever comes directly after a parallel marker should be um, an element. Now, there, there are slight exceptions to this rule, but in general it holds. 
And let me give you some examples, and I'll just uh, preface this by saying I, uh, I, I, I enjoyed this particular set of examples once when I saw Ron teach A Thursdays with Ron. So I'm taking it uh, from him. So maybe some of you, if you came to this about three months ago, <laughs> might have seen this. Otherwise, here's some uh, examples. Um, so give me a second here to type some in, and then uh, you can all weigh in. But wait until I've written them all. So start looking through these as I'm typing them and start to get a feel for which ones you like or don't like. Let's do this actually. Why don't we get people putting check marks, uh, or actually here, I'll do them one by one. Hold on. Those are the last two. Okay, uh, everybody give me a green check. The green check is uh, here. I'm sorry. <laughs> over in this direction. Green check is right there. Give me a green check if you like the first one, a red X if you don't like it. I'm going to ask about all eight of these really quickly, so be ready. Okay, I'd say the majority of the room seems to like it, but definitely there, are, there is dissent. Um, second one, green check, red X. Okay, almost everybody liked this one. Less dissent than last time. Interesting, interesting. Okay, third one. <clears throat> okay, so I'm seeing kind of the same sort of pattern here. A lot more red X's this time. So I think this is definitely worth uh, taking slowly for me. So let's do this. Don't worry about continuing because it will be obvious from here on out what's going to happen. My method is I'm going to isolate the individual elements and make sure they match and whatever comes directly after a parallel marker. And the first thing I'm going to worry about with parallelism is parallel markers. So tell me, in these first two, where are my parallel markers? Uh, so we got to be uh, careful. Or, or is my parallel marker. Okay, it is a preposition. Different, different thing. Parallel marker is a, or is what creates my parallelism here. So if my rule says that whatever comes directly after a marker should be an element, what do I know is one element in this first example? Oh, well, in the first example. So not the second, but the first. So I'm seeing a lot of wrong answers, right? It's got to be Tokyo. Tokyo is what comes after the marker. Take a look at the rule. Whatever comes directly after a parallel marker should be an element. Not before. Before is a different story, okay? So Tokyo has to be one. Now tell me, is there something in this sentence that I can logically parallel Tokyo to? Okay, cool. Everyone's on top of that. Okay, very good. No problem there. Let's go to the next one, you guys. What do I know must be an element based on my rule if or is my marker? Yeah, sort of in, or you could look at it as in Tokyo, like the prepositional phrase in Tokyo. Is there something to parallel that to uh, in the sentence, logically? Yeah, it matches in Beijing. There's no problem here. In Beijing, in Tokyo. Now what you may have noticed is that both of these are okay, even though there is a difference. And it's because we don't know where this element starts. Maybe it starts with just Beijing, in which case this one's okay. Or maybe it starts with in, and it's in Beijing, and that's okay. Okay, let's go to the next set, you guys. Where are my parallel markers in the next set? And in fact, in the next six. <clears throat> yeah, it's actually either and or. So this time I've got a two set, right? I got a two set going on here either an or. So tell me you guys, in example number three, the third one on here, does it look parallel to you based on my rules? Yeah, right. It should be looking pretty good to us because we've got Tokyo, Beijing, right? Because it's got to be whatever comes after the marker. What about the next one? <coughs> Is the next one parallel? <coughs> ah, okay, so you guys are all getting to be on top of this now. In Tokyo, that does not match Beijing. <clears throat> that does not match Beijing, so I'm cutting that out. 
So I just got a private message, somebody asking me if I'm only going to cover verbal. And uh, my response would be, uh, no, I'm going to try to cover some quant, but I would also say in my snarky uh, Manhattan GMAT professor way, if you're scoring higher on verbal than quant in the raw score, not in the percentile, but in the raw score, um, I will send you $3 in the mail. I bet everybody needs verbal more than quant. But I could be wrong, but I'm saying it. Okay, next two, you guys. Which one is wrong, the first one or the second one? Right, okay, we're all getting good at this now, right? The first one, in Beijing, does not match Tokyo, so it is wrong. The second one is nice and clear. And what about the last two? How do we feel? Three dollars, I know, right? That's right, three dollars. You score better on verbal, that's three dollars you got coming your way. What about the last two, you guys? Do we think they're both wrong, one wrong, uh, none wrong? <coughs> Well, let's take a look at our rules, you guys. Um, what is my first parallel element in both of these? First parallel element in both of these. Somebody type it in for me. <clears throat> so be careful. I know I'm using terminology that may be new to you. So markers are the words, and elements are the things that need to be parallel. So the first thing seems to be born. Is born a noun or a verb? It's a verb. What is the second item in the parallel <coughs> in both of these? You can kind of list them out in a row. In the second one, it's a prepositional phrase. In the first one, it's a noun. Neither of those are verbs, you guys. This will not work. Neither of these will work. Now, a lot of people seem to have been getting that wrong, so let me show you what I mean. Yes, Michael, you're absolutely right. I could say, Lucy was either born in Beijing or arrived on Earth by spaceship. Now, in this version, even though I know it's very silly, I've got my either, I've got my or, and if you look at my markers, I have born and I have arrived. Those are two verbs, and this is now parallel. But the other two are not parallel. Everyone give me a smiley face if this is starting to make sense. If you have questions, please ask them, but I was going to move us along. Cool, really good work. It seems like everyone that was, that was making sense by the end. Um, I see a few people writing. I don't want anyone to feel left behind. Any exceptions? Um, <clears throat> yes. Um, there are, and, and I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to ruin the majesty of, of this stuff with exceptions, but occasionally it can be okay to put small words uh, in between conjunctions and their parallel elements, so markers and elements. Um, sometimes you have to for clarity's sake. Um, there are plenty of examples of it uh, in the book, yeah, th there are. Um, I think they might not be until the advanced portion. Um, it's sort of like with modifiers, like, you know, there, there are exceptions to every rule. But I, I would say in general this holds, and it's not like you're going to get tricked by it. It's not like if you use this you're going to get the wrong answer. It's just that sometimes you'll be like, wait a minute, I can't do that. Like, no matter what I do, I can't get the markers to line up exactly and that's probably because you're looking at an exception. Though I think it would be rare to look at an exception if it were on a question that was, you know, lower than, than 700 because this rule is pretty solid. Okay? Okay, I'm going to move us along to the next category. I want to make sure we have time to get through lots of stuff today. What comes after parallelism? So it's actually pronouns if you were going to do it in order, but Thacker and Manju, don't you worry, modifiers are coming next. Okay, now you'll be happy to know, I've been talking about this identification method every time. Pronouns has the easiest identification method in the universe. What are we looking for in the answer choices? It's the easiest thing you could imagine. Just the identification. Now you guys are fixing it now. Ah, everybody, you want it to be so much harder than it is. Pronouns! You're looking for pronouns. Ah, Thacker and Min, you were, you were starting to understand it. Pronouns, you're just looking for pronouns. If you see a pronoun in the underlying portion of the sentence, you are almost 95% chance getting tested on that pronoun. And if you see a pronoun outside of it, you're probably getting tested. So pronouns are all you're looking for, and yes, he, she, it, it, their um, are probably the, the biggest ones. Okay? Now let's talk about the fix. The first thing I'm going to do and a few people have said it, is 
go looking for the antecedent. Some people call it, you know, what it's referring to, the referent or something, but antecedent is the, the correct term. And you want it to agree in a few different ways. And again, a few people have said this. It should agree in number. What else should be true? Who's moving my text around? <laughs> no worries. What else should it agree in? Anything else we know? Now, unambiguous, I'm going to tell you a sad truth, okay? Ambiguity, it turns out, is, the, is an issue that, that GMAT sometimes ignores and sometimes cares about. Um, the best way to think of it, is, of it is this. If you have the choice between a clear noun antecedent, um, sorry, a clear noun and a pronoun, pick the clear noun. Um, by which I mean, um, let me see, I could, I could pop up an example of this. Uh, hold on. Again, a lot of you will have seen this if you took the class, but I think it's a, a sort of good example um, to make the point. Give me two seconds here. Um, so here, I'm gonna just going to pop through some things here, ignore it, nothing happened. Um, let's see, where am I going here? Yeah, so here's an example. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm so, I'm so sorry, this is silly me. Of course, my first time uh, teaching this thing, I forgot. No OG questions, I'll have to write one myself. Don't worry, I'll do it for you. If you get a split like, um, this. If you see something like this, by the company or by it, so ignore this it up front. If you see the split where it's like there's a nice, clear, pretty noun or a pronoun, pick the clear noun because there's a good chance that there's some ambiguity further down the line, okay? The reason why I have to say that, that GMAT is iffy on this is that if you go through the book on your own, you'll see that there are a number of questions where they allow an ambiguous pronoun to remain. However, that ambiguous pronoun will be in all five answer choices uh, in every case that I've seen it. Um, and that means it's not really an issue that you're being tested on. So when you see it split, you might as well pick the noun, not the pronoun, to get rid of ambiguity. But if you don't see it split, probably you don't need to worry about it too much. Okay? Um, one other thing I want to throw out there for the identification method. Who remembers if I saw this kind of split, what category am I supposed to think this is? If I see a split like that, what category have I taught you you should think of? Okay, so right, I want everybody using my terminology. I'm a Nazi about terminology. Subject verb agreement is what we would generally call that, right? Because we have, it's a singular and plural noun split, right? It should be SV agreement. But here's the thing. It could be possible that they would say walks, walk, walks, walks, walk. And you'd go, oh no, this split wasn't useful to me. And that's because further down in the sentence, they would do this. Because of this, which do I need to pick, the man or the men? Exactly. So what we've learned here is that if you see a noun split singular or plural, it could be subject-verb agreement or it could be a pronoun issue. So be careful. There are a couple options there. Everybody give me a smiley face if that makes sense. And I apologize to whichever employee of GMAC watches this uh, for accidentally putting up a slide. Okay, very good, you guys. That is pronouns. Modifiers. Let's talk modifiers. What is my identification method? And I won't lie to you, you guys, this is the hardest one. There's a lot to identify. What are some things I might notice? Okay, very good at uh, us. Commas often set off modifiers. And just so you know, or parallel. If you see commas, it'll pretty much always be either a modifier or a list, parallelism. So commas could go either way. 
what else is going to help you? Long sentence, all underlined? Yeah, yeah, Parthas, that's actually very true, but I'm looking for something a little more specific. But that's a very good point. A longer sentence is very likely to have some underlines. Lee? Mm, I'm going to be iffy on lee. Absolutely, that would be an adverb, but adverbs aren't particularly difficult. That's not what makes modifiers difficult. Adjectives and adverbs, like single words, those are easy to see. What are some modifying phrase types that you guys know? Does anybody know any? Or am I really going to earn my keep here as an instructor? Okay, nice. So now stuff is starting to come in. First, we have relative pronouns. Okay, they open up. Um, modifier. So that, which, who, whom, there's more. There are more than that. Where, uh, when, there's, there's a few others, okay? But relative pronouns open up modifying clauses. What else? Um, Thacker, you're absolutely right on that one, but I'm going to leave it for, for last because it's kind of the, the least, least common, I'd say. Okay, here's one that students ignore a lot. Prepositional phrases, right? That would be like, the man in the house is crazy, right? in the house modifying man, right? Um, and does anybody want an example of a relative clause? Does that, like, is everyone okay with that? Just let me know in the, in the chat window if you want an example of that. I would say the third most common category is a participial phrase. Okay, cool. A participial phrase looks like this. Running from the law, the man got caught, or the man went home. Um, don't worry, I'll make it fit in the page. Running from the law, the man went home. And um, yeah, no, no, don't worry. Okay, some examples of relative pronouns would be, let me move my underline back into place, would be something like, um, the house that I love is on fire, or the woman who gave me this is crazy, etc. So in this case, that I love is modifying the house and who gave me this is modifying woman. In this case, running from the law, the man went home, or I bought a puppy cheering my mother, like that. Okay, and I'll talk about what these all mean kind of in a minute. So these are the most common. Uh, there's also apposition, which is when you use a noun. Uh, that was what Thacker mentioned. Um, apposition looks like this. Um, the man, um, a paragon of virtue went home. If you'll notice, a paragon, that's a noun, a paragon, but it's modifying man. So that's what apposition looks like. And let me put these all in boxes. I want to make sure this is very, very clear on what is what here. Um, I just got asked, participles are difficult to discern from gerund. So for those of you that hate grammatical terminology, I apologize in advance. Um, I'm a fan of terminology. So I'll just, I just want to make sure everybody knows. So Words with ing at the end, <clears throat> there are a lot of things they can be. Uh, among them, participles and gerunds, okay? Now, a participle is when a verb becomes an adjective. And an example of that would be um, the running man, or um, the example I gave before is, is basically, a, this is, a, this is a, a complicated adjective. But running from the law is really just an adjective modifying the man, right? So that's what we call a participle. A gerund is when a verb becomes a noun. And that would look like this. The running of the bulls is an exciting event. Now what you'll notice is that running, the running, is a noun, right? It's a thing, like the running of the bulls. Oh, interesting, it's become a noun now. Even though it looks exactly like the running man, in this case, running is clearly an adjective modifying man, right? So that's the difference between the two. I don't want to really dwell on it overly much um, because I don't think it's like a, the most super useful thing, uh, <laughs> if that's fair for me to say. Um, but there's that. Let me see if I can kind of set it off here in space and time. I don't want it to get in the way here. I'm organizing my uh, slide so people don't get too confused. Okay, so that's the difference there. Hopefully that's, uh, that's helpful. It's all just about how it's being used uh, in the sentence. Um, and, and there you go. Okay, <clears throat> so now I want to get back to modifiers, you guys. The fix, the technique, because I've talked now about how to identify it, the sort of stuff I'm looking for. How do I fix it now? Who knows?
<clears throat> after the comma, put the subjects as part. So that's one way to put it. After the clause, okay, getting closer. It doesn't have to be a clause though, right? You're thinking of relative pronouns and you're not wrong. But it could be a prepositional phrase in the house. That's not a clause, right? A clause has to have a verb. Okay, so it looks like a lot of people are, are close to this, but not totally on it. There are two types of modifiers. Noun modifiers and adverbial modifiers. So noun modifiers only modify nouns, no problem. Adverbial modifiers only modify adjectives, verbs, and clauses. Okay? So as an example, um, so let me, let me just give the rule. Noun modifiers must touch what they modify. They must touch what they modify. That is a rule. And just so you know, relative pronouns only modify nouns. Um, and so does apposition. Unfortunately, um, prepositions, participles can modify both. So you have to be a little bit careful. <clears throat> the rule with verb modifiers is much simpler. They don't have to touch. Okay? So if you're modifying a verb, you don't have to touch it. Um, and the only other rule I would give you is with um, participles, with commas, generally modify entire clauses. So <clears throat> don't worry, I'm going to explain all this stuff. If we look right here where I have participles, which I spelled in a really fantastic way. I'm glad nobody corrected me. You guys are really sweet. Partiple. Participle. Um, participial is what I meant to say. Okay. <clears throat> so what is being modified by cheering here? What's being modified by cheering? <clears throat> is, it, <clears throat> is it the puppy that cheered up my mother? Ah, Dee Dee, the act of buying a puppy. Very good. Very tricky. It's actually the very fact that I bought a puppy. The puppy itself didn't necessarily cheer up my mother, right? It would be like saying, imagine that I change this to Um, and this is no commentary on my life, by the way. I got a girlfriend cheering my mother. Now, it's not my girlfriend inherently who cheered up my mother. It's the fact that I got a girlfriend, right? So this is something that we use participles with commas for. Um, but not always. If I say running from the law, that's just the man. The man was running from the law. So again, we just have to use our logic. You know, somebody asked me here, how do we distinguish between noun and verb modifiers? Um, it's hard to say. I mean, let me, let me give you another set of examples here. I know we're running out of room, and I, I don't want things to get too confusing here, but let me just try one more thing on this page. Is one of these, what I want to hear from you guys, the two examples I just gave, okay? One of these is a noun, one of these is a verb modifier. Which one is which? Uh, let's go with which is the noun modifier. So this is uh, right here. Very good. By the road is modifying house. That's a noun. What is by the time you read this modifying? What is it modifying? What word? So by the road is modifying house. <clears throat> it, yeah, it's modifying will be, actually. So I, by the time you read this, I will be, and then whatever the adjective is, in this case, gone. Could have been green or rich or whatever, right? So that's a verb modifier. Um, <clears throat> and both of these are which type of modifier here in my list. These are both prepositional modifiers, okay? Because by is a preposition, right? So by the road is a prepositional modifier, and a by the time you read this is a prepositional modifier. And I'll try to put that here, kind of, these are prep modifiers right there. 
Okay, so this slide has gotten very busy and no surprise, modifiers are difficult, they're a little bit more complicated than the other categories, but I think that a strong grasp of them is going to be super powerful, so don't underestimate uh, the, the power of getting really good at, at noticing these. Um, and Partha made a good point earlier, they are much more common in long sentences. Okay, any more questions about this or can I move us along to the uh, next category? <coughs> Okay, moving right along then. The next category we talk about in class is verb tense, and people have already told me a lot of great stuff about this one. What's my identification method for verb tense? What am I looking for in the answer choices that's going to clue me in? Yep, <clears throat> much more straightforward, right? It's like the one we compared it to when we were doing subject-verb agreement. Splits in the tense <coughs> of verbs is what you're looking for. Okay, now generally the same verb, because if you see different tenses in different verbs, that might just be a change in tense in every answer choice. So generally you want it to be in the same verb. Well, that's easy enough. <coughs> How do I fix it? Once I've noticed that happening, what do I do? Identify the subject. That's actually for subject verb agreement, you guys. Sorry. This is verb tense. We don't care about the subject for verb tense. <coughs> Logic says Thacker. Well, that, that's a big, that's a, that's, a, that's a vague answer. Time frame. Ooh, Stephanie is the closest so far, but there won't be other sentences because there's only one sentence. So looking for, what are we looking at? Other what? You've almost got it. Nice. Okay, so it's not an or. It is only other verbs. So here's what you do, you guys. If you're not doing this, it's really what you should be. Look for other verbs in the sentence to use as context. Then ask yourself, do my two actions happen at the same time, or does one happen before the other? Use that to pick a tense. That's how you do it, you guys. That, that really is the method. Um, anything other than that is going to be dangerous. Um, quick quick uh, thing here just for the special tenses. What does the present perfect tense look like? Someone give me an example of the present perfect tense. Maybe a bunch of people can try. We'll see how it goes. Nice, okay, so, so far I've only gotten right answers, so I'll assume you're all right. Oh, thanks, Thacker, absolutely, I have been thinking. That one's got the ING thing going on, but yeah, I've been thinking, absolutely. So if it has a has or a have, it's the present perfect. And what do we use the present perfect for? What's it for? See a lot of people writing. Oh yeah, so, so be careful here. Have done, something which is happening, action just finished. That's a few different answers. Gotta be careful. So it's something that starts in the past and continues into the present. That's what it's for, okay? And I'll give you an example of this in a minute, but let's do this really quickly. The past perfect is the one that we, where we see had, and what is this one for? What's the difference? What, what, why would we use the past perfect tense? One action before another and not continuing. Okay, people are getting it in pieces. Yeah, <coughs> it's an action that finished in the past before another past tense action. You need a simple past verb to use past perfect. This is a hard and fast rule, you guys. There are no exceptions. You cannot use the past perfect tense on the GMAT unless that sentence also has a simple past verb. This is why it's so important to do the technique that I mentioned up here, look for other verbs for context. Because if there is no past tense verb, you cannot use the past perfect, okay? If that's not clear, ask me questions. 
And I just want to give you some examples of how these tenses differ. Because a few people said on present perfect, it's something that's finished recently. And I know that that's something that like Kaplan says, um, which I, I take a little bit of, a, of an issue with. Here's my example. Um, I have been to Los Angeles four times. What do you mean that's finished recently? That, that doesn't have to have finished recently. I could have gone four times when I was a baby and now I'm 95 years old. It would still be true that I have been to Los Angeles four times. So I don't like that it's finished recently thing. I don't think it's true. Let's look at the difference. What this is telling you is that I went four times and I have not gone again. Now look at this one. I had been to Los Angeles four times. This one is saying, I went four times, and then at some point, I went again. Do you see how there's this implication that I had only been four times, but now I, I kind of, you know, I must have done something else again. Like, that, that's not true anymore is the implication. And if I just said, I went to Los Angeles four times, like just simple past, it's possible that I went again. Right? It doesn't say I have been four times, like that's it. It just said I went to four times. It, it could have been I went to Los Angeles four times, you know, ten years ago, and then I went again last year. Like it's not clear. Does this sort of make sense, these very slight differences in meaning? I think, I think it's useful to know them. Where is the past verb? Oh, I'm sorry. You're absolutely right. Hold on. That's a really good point, Thacker. I broke my own rule here. I'm trying to teach you kind of how to use it. In everyday speech, <clears throat> we are allowed to use the past perfect um, uh, without it being in the sentence because we could have had a past tense in an earlier sentence. But yeah. Um, uh, here's a better example. I want to make sure it's clear. Before I made this money, I had been to Los Angeles four times. The implication is that then after I made this money, I went again. See, so it implies that I went four times and then went again. So that is the, the sort of, that would be a GMAT correct past perfect. Thank you so much, Thacker, for correcting that. I, I think it, it was confusing the way it was. Um, in everyday English, we do use the past perfect that way, but not on the test. Okay, so this is present perfect, have been, past perfect, had been, and simple past, I went. Everybody clear on these? Are we good on verb tense? I want to move us along here. We're, we're coming up on an hour. <clears throat> oh, there's a question. Okay, cool. Mag, what's the uh, question? I get that, but I want to know what you're not clear on. <clears throat> you mean the examples down here? Is that what you're asking about? Basically, I'm trying to differentiate for you slightly the usage between these different tenses in terms of their meaning, okay? Because sometimes I think that a lot of books misrepresent what the present perfect is for. They say something like a couple people said in this room, which is that it's for something that's finished recently, like a recent problem. But if I say I have been to Los Angeles four times, it, that doesn't have to have finished recently. All four of those trips could have been a long time ago. But what is for sure is that I have not gone again. If I say I have been four times, that comes up all the way to the present moment. I have only been four times. That's implied here. If, however, I use the past perfect, I had been, this is the present perfect. So anything that has have, see how I wrote that right here? Anything that has or have is present perfect. Um, unless it's just the present tense usage of have, like I have a dollar. That's just the present tense. But if we use have in front of a verb, like been, that's a version of I go, the verb to go, then it becomes the present perfect. Just like I could say I had a dollar, and that's just simple past tense. But if I put had in front of another verb, like I had been, it becomes the past perfect. Okay? So anytime you see have, you should assume present perfect. And it implies that this is still true at the present moment. This action starts in the past but continues into the present. Okay? The past perfect, I had been, that implies that I've kind of gone again, right? So if I say before I made this money, I had been to LA four times, that implies that now I've been more than four times. Something, something changed. This action finished in the past. It's over. My four time limit is now over, right? And it's all slightly different from just the basic past. I went four times. It doesn't really make clear whether or not I've been again. So that's why the perfect tenses are more specific. 
they have kind of these very, very specific usages, uh, and that's the only place we use them. Um, cool. Yeah, no worries at all. I'm glad that helped. Um, Jamie, this might be an obvious question. Can the simple past come before the past perfect? Simple past has to come after the past perfect. So like, I made this money after I had been to LA four times. So the past comes after the past perfect. That's why I said action that's finished in the past before a past tense action. So you go back behind it. Um, okay, cool. I hope that's clear, you guys. I do want to make sure we get around to uh, at least uh, a little bit more material, but onwards and upwards I go. Really good work, and I uh, hope that helps. Oops, don't want to go there. I'm making the fresh slide. Okay, after verb tense was comparisons. Now, I don't want to dwell on this one. It is not very interesting. Um, the way you identify it is with comparison markers. What are some comparison markers? Yeah, like, as, such as, less than, than, anything with er, stronger, weaker, cooler, anything with more <coughs> or most, those are all comparison markers. Um, <coughs> and our fix I'm just going to give away, it's exactly like parallelism. Isolate your individual elements and make sure they're comparable. So can I say I have a nicer car than my brother? Or actually, here, let me make this even cleaner. I think that's, that's sort of a misleading example. Let me go with this. <laughs> right? <laughs> I'm giving you just very silly wrong answers to kind of illustrate this. We obviously need to compare car and, and brother's car, right? No, says everyone passionately. Um, so, uh, so that's really all, all it's about. Comparisons should not be uh, super difficult. <clears throat> Though a few uh, little differences here I want to make sure everyone's cool on. What is the difference between like and as? Can anybody tell me what is like for? So I used to teach this part of the way that you said it, and, and it turned out to confuse a lot of people. So we have to be a lot more specific. So first of all, one thing that's going to piss a ton of people off, like versus as is not the same as like versus such as. I'm not talking about like versus such as. I'm talking about like versus as. Like is used to compare nouns, and as is used to compare clauses. Um, what do you think? Is this okay? Give me a green check if you like it, a red X if you don't. So I'm seeing all no's. And believe it or not, technically this is considered okay, and no one has given me a green check. Uh, <laughs> very interesting. Um, this is actually okay, you guys, and the reason why is that my brother is still technically a noun, and I am a noun, and I'm clearly comparing that. Now, I know what you're thinking. It kind of looks like my brother is like cheese, and I, I know you think that, but actually this is considered okay. Here's where we would use as. Uh, or let me give you actually a different example. Would this be okay? Give me a green check or a red X. Green check or red X? Um, okay, so I'm seeing kind of people split. No, it's, it's working. I can see it. Uh, I turned off responses visible, so you can't see other people. So I can see it when you type it in. Um, okay, so here's the thing, you guys. Um, this is not okay, but I'm seeing a, a lot of green checks. Is, at, is like my brother does, is that a clause or a noun? What is a clause anyway? Can anyone tell me in the chat window what a clause is? A clause has a verb. That's what a clause is. So when I add the word does, this becomes a clause. And if it's a clause, I need to use as. It has to be as my brother does. 
that's what we use as for. So this would unfortunately be out. And that's actually the only rule about like versus as really. Um, would people like some more examples of this? Would that be helpful? Are people feeling confused on it? Yeah? Okay. Here's what I'm going to do. I know some people have taken the class, but we have just a super ultra useful slide that gives like eight examples in a row. So give me two seconds here and I will bring that up for you and I think you will all be super hyper, uh, grateful. It's a good one. Just give me a second to uh, pop it up. Okay, here we go. All right, let's start here. Green check, red X. Joe, like Mary, lives in a stucco house. Green check or red X? <clears throat> all right, cool. I'm seeing almost all green checks, and you're absolutely right. We're comparing Joe to Mary, and they are both nouns. Very good. What about this? Joe lives in the stucco house like Mary. <coughs> um, so you guys just give me a green check if you like it and a red X if you don't. Uh, that's all. And the green check and the red X are located next to the blue door, kind of here by the chat window. <coughs> okay, so, so I fooled a few of you a second time, but most of you were on top of it. Once again, you guys, this is actually okay because like Mary is not a clause. So even though I know what you're thinking, it sounds like Mary's a house, uh, which is very sad for Mary. But technically, logic tells us Joe's compared to Mary. And um, GMAT has said this is okay. Let's try a third example. Joe lives in a stucco house like Mary. Um, it's not parallelism factor. We call this just comparison. And yeah, the point is that um, yes, Mary and Joe is actually a clear, clearly parallel slash comparable. <clears throat> what do you think about number three here? I'm missing a lot of people. A green check, red X. Okay, so now we have a problem. Now we have a problem because Joe lives in a stucco house like Mary. It's not clear at all. And in fact, now the like is just pointing to house. There's no uh, issue there. Uh, there's, there's no way we can read this as it's Mary and Joe that are being compared. Um, it just sounds like Mary is a house. And I know this is annoying that they're so similar, um, but these are the rules as we've read them uh, in the OG questions and, and just, just how it is. Uh, let's try another one. Green check, red X on number four. Number three is wrong. Number three is very wrong. It sounds like Mary is a house and without the comma, um, it's just a sort of touching noun modifier almost. I mean, that's how it feels. What about number four? Okay, I'm seeing, let's see, a majority of green checks. The green checks have it barely. What am I comparing uh, Joe to this time around? Well, or, uh, let's put it this way, sorry. What is being compared here? Yeah, we are comparing house to Mary's house. And believe it or not, this is definitely true here. Mary's, the, the house is implied. Um, it is actually implied. So this is okay. Uh, you want me to, oh, somebody asked me, yeah, yeah, you can always tell me publicly. It's okay to give me, give me pointers. Um, someone asked me to put a green check next to the ones that we like. Absolutely. So this first one was good to go. This second one was actually good to go, even though it's really annoying. And this fourth one is good to go. All right, let's look at number five. What do you think? Green check or red X. Four is correct, Partha, because we're using like, but the Mary's with an apostrophe S is a possessive. So it's Mary's house is implied. That's grammatically allowed. So we are comparing two nouns, house to house. So we use like. Okay, I'm seeing almost entirely green check here. Really good work, you guys. Absolutely does has now made this into a clause. So we need as. Few more. Number six, give me a green check or a red X. All right, I'm seeing almost entirely red X's, which uh, is very good. Why do we not, why can we not use like here? Ah, why can we not use like here? What word? 
is, right? It's the word is. The is makes it a clause, so we have to use as. Very good. Two more, you guys. Number seven, green checker, red X. Okay, cool. I'm seeing almost entirely green checks, um, and you're absolutely right. We have as, and this is a clause because we've got is again, right? Is makes it a clause, so as is great. And finally, the last question, number eight. Give me a green check or a red X. Cool. I'm glad. <laughs> I'm here to help. <laughs> All right, you guys, I, this is really great. I am seeing all green checks. Um, in this case, I know it's a, a tough one, but remember what we're concerned about is the part where the like actually is, right? And the like here, there is no verb within this section. So like swimming, skiing, that is allowed. So this is correct um, because we're comparing two nouns, swimming and skiing, um, not the clauses themselves. So. Um, this went really well, I think, though plenty of people still had problems. So if you have questions, feel free to, to ask them. I don't want people to feel like totally left behind. Um, I realize I'm powering through this, you guys. I just want to make sure this is uh, useful to everyone. Um, okay, great. So I'm going to move us along then to the last sentence correction category. Um, if people have leftover questions about that, let me know. Oh, I'm sorry. I want to add one more thing here just because a lot of people got confused. Like versus as is one difference. Like versus such as is a separate difference. So what, what is the difference between like and such as? This is much easier, don't worry. Exactly. So like means is similar to and such as means um, sorry you guys, I'll, I'll try to come, come back to it. Um, um, <laughs> yes, Joe lives in a stucco house like that of Mary's, absolutely. Um, actually, I think it just said like Mary's. I think it was just like Mary's back there. I'll bring it back up, but I, I want to do this. Um, okay, such as is used for examples. And here's the big rule, you guys. It's nice and easy. Whenever you see answer choices split, hold on, I'm typing it out for you. Answer choices split between like and such as, such as. I have yet to see an exception to this rule. And the reason why is that all of us are children of the 21st century and we use the word like for everything. We love the word like, man. It's like totally awesome, the word like. And uh, the GMAT knows that and they're going to just try to trick you into picking like. But they will never trick you into picking such as because that's not where your brain would typically go. Um, <clears throat> so that's that. Um, Okay, so um, really quickly, you guys, here's the slide again. I'll just show it for 15 or 20 seconds here, um, but that's all. Remember, there's a recording of this class that you all have access to. So if you need to see any of this stuff again, you can always watch the recording again. Um, but I want to make sure we get through as much uh, material today as possible. But I know uh, a couple of people asked me to put this up again, so here it is. Uh, if you're taking a screen cap or something, hopefully not. Um, but uh, yes, you can always watch the recording again if you need to uh, see it. Um, a semicolon. Of, let me finish my last category and then uh, I will answer that question. I want to make sure I get through this, uh, but uh, don't, don't let me forget in, in maculata. I will uh, try to do it. The last category is idioms and it is sort of the least useful uh, category in the universe. Um, anyone who's been through our materials, you might not know otherwise because we might be specific on this. Does anyone know how you identify idioms? Well, believe it or not, now we have a whole book of, of idioms or a whole 80 pages and there's no real rule, but believe it or not, there is actually an identification method. Now what you're thinking of is there isn't really a way to fix it. You just kind of have to know. Yeah, oh, Sudanshi, thank you so much. That's absolutely right. Splits and prepositions, by which I mean you will very often see something like this. Um, let me just do some notes. Um, et cetera, et cetera. 
like you would see something like this. And if you notice, there's a split here for to and as, right? Um, to and as. In this case, we have no preposition. But that is often a signal that you are dealing with an idiom. And this, in fact, is an idiom. This is the idiom surrounding considered. What is the right answer here? Yeah, you can call them uh, 1, 2, 3, and 4. Uh, so believe it or not, the uh, correct idiom is, yeah, consider x, y. You don't use anything. So not to be, not as. This is the kind of thing that we say wrong in English all the time, so it's one of GMAC's favorites because <laughs> uh, we get it wrong so often. The little fix that we have for um, dealing with these is called spot extract replace. And I think it's kind of cool. I think it's what most people do anyway, but it's useful. Um, which is basically like notice, it's kind of like notice the idiom split. Actually notice, you know, by which I mean like you have to actually notice that it's the category idiom. Uh, the correct answer here is B, number two. Gotcha, okay. People love the check mark, all right? <laughs> all right, check mark it is. Um, he's considered a great man, no problem, right? So notice the idiom split. And then what you do is try it out in your own little sentence. In other words, extract it from the sentence and give it your own little one. Now, now the example I've used here is, is already kind of extracted. It's very simple. But the idea is that oftentimes sentences about idioms will be really, really complicated looking with lots of prepositional phrases in the hopes of confusing you. So if you try your own little sentence, pick what word you like and replace it back in the big sentence. Hopefully that will help you out. But like most of you said, the big issue on idioms is memorize idioms, obviously. Okay, you guys, that is my little more than an hour overview of all the sentence correction categories. Remember that sentence correction is the single most important part of this test uh, for everyone. Verbal is heavier weighted than quant, and sentence correction is the easiest place to improve. Um, but if if any of the stuff I told you today was like totally new, then that's a sign that you definitely have uh, more reading to do. And I would say pretty much everything I said today, with some rare detail exceptions, is the kind of stuff that you want to be pretty solid on um, at, the, at the sort of top of your mind, because GMAT still knows how to make it hard. Um, um, I don't want to replay each page for a couple section, seconds, Dee Dee, because I, I don't want to like actively encourage um, sort of the, the screen capping thing um, if that's what's going on. Um, but but the, the whole video will be recorded and that's much, much more efficient. So honestly, if you want to screen cap it, like get all these slides, you can still do it. Um, but I'd rather do that than kind of spend too long um, going through all of them. Um, is that true? All right, you know what? I'm going to be a nice, nice dude. I do want to make sure everybody reviews it. So here we go. Subject verb agreement. You're going to identify with verb split and noun split singular plural. You're going to fix it by matching them up. Okay? I'm going to go really fast though. So that was the first one. Parallelism. You're going to look for these parallel markers, which are generally conjunctions, either, or, and, etc. Your fix is you're going to isolate the individual elements and match them up. And the best way to remember is that whatever comes right after a marker is uh, one of your elements. Then we talked about pronouns. Basically, you identify it just by seeing any pronouns, right? And the fix is you go looking for the antecedent, uh, and it should agree in number and not be ambiguous. And also keep in mind that if you see a noun split singular plural, it could be subject verb agreement or pronoun, right? So here, uh, one thing I'll add to this slide, uh, just because this is, this is for you, Ivan, right here. All right, you ready for it? Clearly, we would need to use they in this case um, because, or sorry, we would need the men because we got they at the end. So that's that. Um, I see a, a hand raised. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you have a question or if that's a, a, a note on the check. Let me get through these real quick and then Ivan, I'll let you on the mic. Modifiers, we identify with lots of different things. Commas help us out, but they don't have to be there. Relative pronouns, prepositional phrases, participles, apposition, lots of different stuff. This is the hardest one to identify, but our fix will be to remember that noun modifiers must always touch. Verb modifiers don't have to touch, okay? Then we talked about verb tense, very easy identification if it's split in tense, and then your fix is to look for another verb or two to use as context for what you need to do. And then we talked specifically about when to use these two special tenses, um, the present perfect 
and the past perfect, which get their own little uh, boxes here. We then talked about comparisons. We're looking for these comparison markers, like, as, then, any kind of stronger, weaker. And we fix them just like parallelism. We isolate the individual elements and make sure they're comparable. Uh, and then we talked about the difference between like and as, clauses versus uh, nouns, and like versus such as. And finally, idioms, splits and prepositions, spot extract replace. OK. Um, Ivan, did you have a question? Let me know in the chat window if that's a yes, and I'll give up the mic. Um, and work right to left. Um, I'm not sure what that means, but it sounds intriguing. How do you connect two independent clauses, people are asking me. Okay, we can talk about this uh, a little bit since we're on the uh, sentence correction tip. Um, independent clauses can only be connected by period or semicolon. Um, th that's it. You, you're, you're not allowed to have two separate independent clauses in the same sentence unless you use a semicolon. So that's what a semicolon is for, by the way. Um, y yeah, I'm not sure what you mean. So like, oh, I, I see what you mean. I'm sorry. I, I totally see what you mean. Okay. Let, let, me, let me back up. So what you're saying is like you're never really specifically asked to do this. So if you're saying like if you want to connect, I walked to the store and I went home, you can put an and in the middle. This is what you're saying. I see. Yeah. Sure. You can do that with anything. I walked to the store, right? Or, or I want I want a chicken or I want more money. Now obviously it's kind of silly to repeat the I want and make a clause, but we could technically do it. I, I think what's, what's more interesting here is that if you have two things that stand alone, um, the semicolon is what you use if you're not using a conjunction. The conjunction is kind of the sort of straightforward basic sentence way to do it. But the, uh, the semicolon is what we use to separate two independent clauses when we don't get a conjunction. Right? So like, I walk to the store. Um, let me pick two that would actually be useful. There are too many cars on the road, semicolon. Yesterday, I was in traffic for, for three hours. Right? So in that case, like, there's sort of a, a connection between the two in terms of meaning. Um, a colon is, not, is, is used for examples a lot of the time. It's also sometimes used for result. Um, so in other words, the, the important thing to remember about colons is whatever comes before a colon must be an independent clause. And for those, those of you that may be wondering what these terms mean, independent clause could stand alone as a sentence. Dependent clause could not. So whatever comes before a colon must be an independent clause. That's really the only thing you need to know about the colon. Um, so yeah, Mary, if you say I walked to the store and went home, those now aren't two independent clauses because the second clause doesn't have a subject anymore. Like you would have to say I walked to the store and I went home if you want to have two independent clauses. Uh, if you just use a conjunction, that's one independent clause with a list of things that you did. Okay? Um, it's, it's not even a clause. It's not a dependent clause to say and went home because there's no, there's no sort of subject really there. The whole clause is I walked to the store and went home. Um, you're not tested on m dashes stacker, so don't even don't even worry about dashes. Thankfully, um, if you're interested in the m dash, it functions a lot like a like a like a colon. But it, it, I don't I don't think you're definitely not tested on it grammatically. And I'm not sure I've seen it used very often, but I've never seen it tested. Um, and yes, from before it was you always use such as. Um, any other questions, you guys, about this stuff? How do you connect an independent and dependent clause? Um, th that's what all commas and, and, and conjunctions are for. So th there's no easy answer to that. And I don't want to get into too much specific stuff here. Um, yeah, a colon in a sentence would be, I'm into all kinds of music, rap, jazz, and hip hop. I'm into all kinds of music is, a, is an independent clause. So I couldn't say, um, I like rap, jazz, and hip hop, you know, like you would on Facebook or OkCupid okay or whatever, right? <laughs> um, you can't say that. That's a no-no. I'll put a red line through it so nobody gets uh, confused here. Because it's not an independent clause before the colon. 
<coughs> no, you, would, you don't need to say such as immaculata. No, you can just say rap, jazz, and hip hop. Um, that's kind of a, it's not the best example in the world, to be honest, but it's not an issue of like versus such as. It's just kind of, kind of unclear. To be honest, you guys, I really mean this. The thing you need to know about colons is that whatever comes before them is an independent clause. That's all you need to know. That's all you need to know about them. Um, I've never seen, it's not about such as. Yeah, I, I, you wouldn't use such as. That would be weird. Um, well, you know what, I, I'm not going to make that a rule. I think you could use such as just fine. I'm going I'm to take that back. I think such as would be fine. Um, you're just not going to be tested on it, like on what comes after the colon. That's not going to be the game. The game's always going to be, did the thing that come before it actually make for a full sentence? Because that's how they really get you, because that's how you're used to hearing it used or seeing it used on, you know, web pages and such. Um, okay, you guys, I feel like we're getting into like really sort of small, tiny issues. And for most of these, you should look them up on the internet or in the book. Um, just because like I could kind of do like one-off things forever. Um, and we had a ton of those in the questions, but I kind of want to hit bigger overall things. So if it's all right with you guys, we only have about uh, 15 minutes left here. Um, I'd like to do just a little itty bitty run through of uh, critical reasoning. Um, and I hope that's okay. I don't mean for anybody to feel cut off. It's just that I got a list this morning of like 100 questions that got asked by people and tons of them were really, really sort of tiny one-off issues. So Let's just do a critical reasoning overview uh, in, in the little time we have left. Um, who can tell me the, uh, I don't know, one type of critical reasoning? Now, I'll tell you, there's, there's only one I want to talk about first. What is the most common central type? So people said weaken. Interesting. Now I'm seeing a couple assumptions. I like that you know the different types and you know what the heck I'm talking about when I say different types. I want to start with assumptions. And the reason why I want to start with assumption is that it's kind of the, the, the beating heart of critical reasoning because both strengthen and weaken, which are also really common, often revolve around uh, assumptions as well. So I want to start there. So we're going to start with finding the assumption. How do you identify it? How do I know that I'm dealing with a find the assumption question? Like, what am I looking for in the question stem? <clears throat> okay, so here's what I'm going to do first. A very, very brief review. And actually, on our blog right now, we have a really great entry on critical reasoning. If you haven't read it, it's really fascinating. Uh, and I won't repeat all of it here. But the basic idea is this. The first, yeah, we have a blog, because Manhattan Team, that's awesome, and we're in the 21st century. We need a podcast now and an iPhone app. Give it time. Give it time. Um, there is a blog and we talk about this. Step one for all critical reasoning, and people ignore it, you guys. I can't tell you how many students ignore it. Read the question stem. And if you really want to understand why, um, there's a GMAT prep iPhone app, right? Or, or GMAT has one. We don't have our own yet, I don't think. But we should. I don't, I don't know if other companies do. Hopefully not yet. I want to be the first. Um, <coughs> read the question stem first. Flashcards we've got. We've got flashcards on our website. Um, and the reason why you want to read the question stem is that it tells you how you're going to outline. Um, if you just go to www.manhattangmat.com, uh, you'll see a, a button for the blog. I don't, I don't know. It might just be slash blog. I bet it is, in fact. Um, oh, nice. Min, thank you so much for putting that in for me. So that's, that's the must-use strategy for critical reasoning, and it's a really great entry. I really, I really recommend it. Um, but reading the question stem is going to tell you how you outline. Now, everybody, I want, I want some honesty here, okay? You don't have to lie to me. I'm, I'm your friend. Give me a green check if when you do critical reasoning you always outline something. Give me a red X if you keep it in your head because it just takes too damn long to take notes. I know how it is. Okay, a few more people. Green check if you take notes every time. Red X if you, you're known not to take notes. Okay, so I'm going to publish this to the, to, the, to the thing here, okay? Now, this is more, a lot more, twice as many red X's as green checks. Now, I'm not your everyday teacher, so I'm, I'm going to play the bad cop, and hopefully you won't judge me for it. When I see people that don't take notes, I promise them, this is my solemn vow to you, you will never get better at critical reasoning in general until you take notes. It will never happen. 
And I, I want to remind you of why. I think this is really important. So for those of you who do it, I apologize for my little rant here. But the fact is that first of all, it is scientifically proven, and you can look this up, that you read much better when you know you have to take notes. You actually pay more attention because you're not allowed to zone out because your brain knows, crap, I need to write it down so I can't zone out, okay? That's reason number one. Reason number two is that if you don't take notes, there's nothing you can get better at that is in any way tangible or quantifiable. If you don't take notes, your hope is kind of, I'm just going to do a bunch of questions and hopefully somehow I'll just get better. But you're not practicing anything. It would be like assuming you'd get better at the piano if you just read sheet music all day. You have to actually do it and do something differently that you can get better. So now here's Sudanshu, thank you for asking that question. I teach a lot on the forums. I, I do a lot on the uh, Beat the GMAT, um, sorry, GMAT Club forums. Um, and what people say when I try to convince them to take notes is exactly the question I just got. I don't take notes because it takes me too long. If you do this correctly, it does not take too long. The reason why it takes people too long is they write down too much because they don't want to actually do the work of breaking something down into the salient details. In other words, the conclusion, the premises, sometimes counter premises. They don't want to do that work because it's too brain intensive, so they just write down everything. Like, if I just copy it all down, then I've taken notes. The problem is that's doubly bad because now you've taken a bunch of time and you haven't really helped yourself. All you've really done is copy down the passage. And when those people take notes, those are the ones who then say to me, I hate taking notes. It takes me all day and I learn nothing. Well, does everyone see, give me a smiley face if you see now how those two things just kind of play together. Like if you take bad notes, it's going to take way longer and you're going to not get it done. It's like the worst of both worlds, right? Yeah, yeah, so don't worry. So let's talk now about what the heck I mean when I say outline. For find the assumption and strength and weaken, and we're going to run out of time here, so I hope you don't mind, but I'm going to try to put stuff together. So here we go. For all three of these, you're going to outline the same way. Okay? You're going to write down the conclusion, which is the biggest claim. You're going to write down the premises, which are any facts or claims that support, let me make sure we have room here, support the conclusion. And if there are any, though to be honest, most of the time there aren't, you can write down counter premises, which are any facts or claims that undermine the conclusion. Okay? That's what you're going to do every time. On draw conclusion questions, which are the next most common, all you need to do for the outline, it's nice and easy, is you just write down the premises, because there is no conclusion, you're drawing it yourself, uh, and there's no assumption. Okay? And actually, I can even add one more to this, believe it or not. Um, it's called the uh, it's got like sort of a longer name, but the questions that ask you like what is the argument structure, so these are the ones with bold, you know, the ones that have bolded statements, that's argument structure. You outline those the same way as well. So there's not a lot of variation here, which is nice to know. And Sherrod said do the T-bar. Absolutely, that's one way to do it. Um, it's just one way to organize it. But the important part is that you're writing down conclusions, premises, and counter premises. Now, from there, your methodology is going to be a little bit different. Okay? So here, let me do this. So then you outline, and then step three would be use whatever process of elimination technique applies to that question type. So here's your kind of overall critical reasoning stuff. You read the stem because it affects how you outline. Then you outline, and these are the two major different types of outlining. Um, the, the, the final type, and again, I might as well put it in here. The next most common question type is explain a discrepancy. And to outline that, all you need to do is write down the discrepancy in your own words. So this is it, you guys. This is what you're writing down for the, the five, I would say, most common popular critical reasoning types. There are a couple other little ones that aren't worth my, my kind of agonizing over because you don't see them very often. So now let me just try to do a couple minutes here before we go on, on each of these types and what I mean down here by process of elimination technique, okay? For, hold on, da, da, da. For find the assumption. The big process that you're going to use is least extreme negation. Can anybody explain that to me? 
Does anybody know what I mean in the chat window? Does anyone know what the heck least extreme negation is? What the heck is he talking about? Frowny face. Okay, cool. Don't worry. I'll explain it. Because you're looking, and I'm going to type this out here. I want to make sure it's clear, but it will be a few words. Because you're looking for an assumption on which the argument depends, if you take the opposite of the correct answer, the argument should fall apart. Let me give you an example. If I say Dave doesn't have a thousand dollars, he will never get married. What is the assumption in this argument. So this is the conclusion I hope we can all see. This is the premise. What is my assumption here? Not just he. We can get more general. Yeah, you need a thousand dollars to get married. Now whether or not that's true, I don't know. Um, right, so that's my assumption. If you saw an answer choice, so now imagine the answer choices are down here. Okay, A, B, C, D. I didn't leave room for E, but imagine there's an E. And you saw one that said, now this is a very stupid argument, I realize, but bear with me here. Let's say you saw this as an answer choice, you know. You know, and, and, and you had all these other answer choices, okay. The correct answer would be the one where if you took the opposite, the argument would fall apart. So let me go to B here. The opposite here would be you do not need a thousand dollars to get married. And let me actually put that in a different color so you can kind of see. You do not need a thousand dollars to get married. Suddenly the argument doesn't work. Do you all see what I mean? Suddenly the argument falls apart now. If you don't need a thousand dollars to get married, well then we can't conclude that Dave won't get married just because he doesn't have a thousand dollars. Whereas if I took the opposite of some other one here, Dave's girlfriend is not shallow, it still doesn't affect my conclusion at all. So we call this least extreme negation um, because whichever one kind of has the most extreme effect is the correct answer. Does that kind of make sense? I I'm sorry if it's a little bit vague. I'm trying to, to move through here. A list of logical opposites. I'm not, I'm not quite sure what you mean, Thacker. You want to come on the mic? Aha. Uh, I'm not quite sure what you mean, so try to formulate your question differently. I want to go on to the next kind of question type. Um, yeah, not necessarily will negate. It depends very much. Like the opposite of always is not never, it's sometimes. Um, that's, so yeah, you kind of have to work on that. Um, but again, you can go into the details uh, on your own. They're in plenty of books. I'm, I'm trying to do kind of a big overview here. and We're running low on time. Yeah, yeah, the word combinations, I think they're in the book, Thacker, our book or, or you know, any book, but I, I know they are in our book somewhere um, in the chapter on finding something. Draw a conclusion question, you guys. Does anybody know anything cool about draw a conclusion question? Yeah, so the, I'm saying that when you take the opposite of it, Whichever one destroys the argument is the correct answer. So like the opposite should destroy the argument because the argument only works if you have it. So if you take the opposite, the argument ought to fall apart. That's the goal. Does anyone know anything about this type of question? Draw a conclusion? Okay, maybe not. So here's what it looks like. Which of the following is best supported by the passage? I hope you can all see that it's very easy to confuse with strengthen. Right? Because strengthen says which of the following best supports the passage. And this says which of the following is best supported by the passage. And again, we're, we're running out of time, so I'm just going to tell you. Okay? For draw a conclusion, you're looking for something that must be true based on the premises. Okay? Which means the correct answer will generally be very, and this is a very a technical term, wussy. Stay away from extreme language, all, every, 
uh, always stuff like that. Okay? That's that's the big that's the big takeaway there. And then I just want to do um, a little bit here on strengthen and weaken. Our overall method for strengthen and weaken is we make a little chart called the SW flash chart. So you ID this obviously strengthen, weaken, support, undermine. Those are kind of the big words. And the fix, hi. Um, and the fix is make the SW flash chart for each answer choice. So work out if each answer has no effect, strengthens, or weakens. So this is just kind of a general approach to the to the four most common um, parts that we don't we don't really have a time. Oh, oh, here's what it would look like if that's what you mean. So you would just write down like A B C D E on your paper, and then you would say like, oh, answer choice A, I feel like it strengthens a little. Answer choice B, it strengthens a lot. C is totally irrelevant. D is totally irrelevant, and E weakens a little. So it's just a means of organization of keeping track. I mean, the upshot is that you need to be reading every answer choice and thinking about what it does. Uh, you can't get the right answer um, unless you read every answer choice. So in response to somebody asking, like, you know, isn't this time consuming? Um, you know, there's, there's no good answer. I mean, it's sort of like, you know, math is time consuming if you don't know how to do it as well. This isn't inherently more time consuming. It's just that you need to read quickly and you need to understand quickly. Um, which is the same as with quant. You know, you need to read quickly and you need to understand quickly. Um, and uh, I promise you that every question is doable with note taking in, you know, two minutes and 15 seconds. It's totally doable. Um, so that's what I would say. Um, okay, you guys, any kind of final questions? I believe that's um, time. I believe this is scheduled from, from 4.30 to 6.00. Um, we got through that sentence correction. That seemed to be pretty useful. And this is most of um, critical reasoning. Actually, just to help you out, I hate to leave anybody uh, hanging. <laughs> what foods are helpful for breakfast on test day? Nice. Um, the last one that's kind of common, and I just want to make clear what our method is on it, is um, argument structure. And I just want to say this is the one with bolds in it. And uh, after you've outlined, your fix is just generally work out whether each bold is a conclusion, a premise, or a counter premise. That will generally get you the answer. Then take on each bold, uh, take on the answer choices one bold at a time. So I just want to throw that in there as well so you can see the, uh, the last one. I think that's the most, the next most common. And that's everything, you guys. That's all I got. So I hope, uh, I was an adequate replacement for the great uh, Ron Purewall. Those are some big shoes to fill. Um, let's see. Okay, cool. Uh, I'll stick around for a few minutes if you have some questions. Um, Thacker, I'm not 100% sure. I can look here. I have the uh, critical reasoning guide in front of me. Sorry, I just got a private message about where all those least negation techniques are. Let me see if it's in here. Um, da -da 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 -da. Um, let me see if it's in the back. No, okay. Um, I'm looking for a page. I'll see if I can find it. Otherwise, thank you, everyone. I remember the recording will be available soon. Um, the examples are on page 68, um, it looks like. I see a bunch of them on 68, yeah. Um, and there's, it starts on 64 and goes all the way through 68 of the Critical Reasoning Guide. Um, no, of our, our guidebook on critical reasoning, um, if you don't have our guidebooks, I can't tell you. It's uh, guide number six, critical reasoning. Um, and it's 64 through 68. Aw, thanks, Mag. Glad to, uh, glad to help. Um, but there's so many other words. Um, Thacker, but, but it's not that there's so many other words. Typically, you can just put not in front of things. So I'm just getting asked about least extreme negation. Typically, you can just put not or don't. Like, if I say I like monkeys, which I do, the opposite would just be, I don't like monkeys. And that's going to work for like 20% of sentences. Or if I say, I can go to school, the opposite is just, I can't go to school. So it's, it's not like you need like a giant list. The only one that confuse people is like, I always go to school. The opposite of that wouldn't be, I never go to school. It would be, I sometimes go to school. That's sort of the logical opposite. 
Um, or, or even better put is if I never go to school, the opposite is I sometimes go to school. I actually think that one makes more sense. Always and sometimes is a little bit tough. But definitely the opposite of always isn't never. That's for sure. Um, and, and that's what is explained in the book is these kind of weird, weird ones where finding the opposite can be a little bit odd. But most of the time factor, this should work. No problem. Glad to help. Any more sort of uh, questions about what we've gone over? I don't want to get uh, too off topic, but if anything wasn't clear, I don't, I don't want to leave anybody uh, confused. Yay, thanks for the applause. <laughs> no problem at all, everybody. Um, <laughs> Snacks, you're sort of welcome. <laughs> no problem, Immaculata. I like trying to pronounce your name, Immaculata. That's pretty. I like it. Though I have to ask, Immaculata Mora. Mora just from what is Mora? What does that mean? Kind of looks like a sort of, the you know, an inscription that you would you would you would have, you know. <laughs> All right, cool enough. And then you really like Duran Duran. So you're Immaculata Mora, giant fan of Duran Duran. Oh, does it mean mine? Ah, oh, that makes more sense. That makes a lot more sense. I was going to say it kind of looks like death. It's a little creepy, but mine, that makes a lot more sense. Is there any homework? Um, gosh, I get to be a real teacher. 20 push-ups, three Hail Marys. Um, no, you know, I would say just focus on this stuff. Um, you know, don't, don't lose it. So definitely review this or print it out. Um, you know, that's all. We were very general today, I know. Um, I think that's the most useful. So I would say the best homework for you guys is just to pretty much have all of this stuff pretty close to memorized, you know? And, and not just memorized like you can repeat it, but that you really understand it. That this is the stuff you do as soon as you see a certain kind of question. This is exactly where your brain goes. That's, that's the trick. Um, so there's your homework and the push-ups. On parts of that, I don't know. I think Ron does it once a month, and I, I don't imagine, um, I don't know if it's the same. It might be the, the fourth Thursday of every month. That sounds right, that it's the last Thursday of every month that he does this. Um, oh, is it every two weeks? Oh, okay, it's every two Thursdays then. But I think he'll do, uh, he'll probably be doing most of them. I, I'm his fill-in guy. So if you really want me, you would have to, um, cause him to have some kind of accident. So, you know, I don't think it's going to happen. But, you know. <laughs> um, yes, and I do private tutoring if people are interested in private tutoring. So I'm very busy right now, but I, I, am, I am capable of doing private tutoring. Uh, and I do it online and stuff if, if that's the kind of thing you're into. Um, do I teach in DC? Uh, not live, because I live in San Francisco. But I do online tutoring with people all over the world. Um, uh, if, if you're, you're into that. But generally, you know, I would say it's better to work with someone local um, just because, you know, you can be face to face and that's easier. I generally do online teaching with people that live in places that, that don't have any tutoring centers. Um, or if you're just a really heavy worker and you want to do online. Um, questions in the book seem easier than the real test. I don't think that's true. Oh, unless you mean the official guide uh, in Maculata. That, that's definitely true. Because the official guide isn't adaptive. So, you know, it's, it's just whatever difficulty level the question is. Whereas the test will just hang out at exactly the hardest level you're capable of. Um, okay, you guys, we're close to uh, 10 minutes over and the questions seem to be dying down. So I'm going to uh, stop the recording here.